Hi guys, it's Alex Romano. How's everyone doing? Good, 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 I hope. So, uh, I wanted to do another chit chat, overview, review, you know, just general chinwag, really, about Knee Magazine issue four. I did this when I finished reading my issue three. Issues one and two are not out in English, and I really hope they do release them in English because being the typical Gemini that I am, I don't like to have incomplete sets of things. No, I just can't. I can't do it. So if you don't know what Knee Magazine is, it is a magazine for perfume lovers. It's been coming out for a few years now. It comes out bi-annually. Um, I'll also link the video to the first video like this that I did. Uh, but I finally finished this one. It takes me so long because they're so jam-packed full of amazing information and fun and just all-round greatness, really. So it's an olfactory magazine, each one having a main article. The previous one was the sex of scent. This one is about, is perfume an art form and are perfumers artists? But obviously there's tons of other stuff as well. There's super cool features all the time. I'm getting to know the kind of pattern of this magazine now. So I'm just gonna kind of skim through. I guess if you wanna buy this, I'm not gonna spoil everything, but I'm gonna talk about some of the highlighted bits that I really enjoyed with this issue. And I just love this. I have all of the other editions, so I'm just going to dive into the next one as soon as I finish this video, I think, because I'm on a bit of a roll with reading this. So, this one is issue four. So, I'll post a link to where you can buy it directly from them. There are other places in the world you can buy it in terms of shops and stuff like that. So, I would look around for it if it's something that you want to get your teeth into. So, anyway. Just a quick overview of what it is. I put sticky notes in it this time. I was really organized. <laughs> so, uh, just an introduction about can, uh, can a scent be a work of art? There's a lot, it, it kind of, that's the theme of the whole magazine this time. They've also got their features that are in every magazine, so that's really good. There's an introduction to a lot of artists, um, some of whom have which have, some of whom have which have worked, some of whom have worked in the perfume industry. Not all of them have, but it's just about, it's just like a little mini interviews with them about what's your first olfactory memory? Uh, is there any odor that you cannot live without? And they're all different people. They're all from different backgrounds. Then it goes into icons. This is, I think, a feature that's in every one because it was in the last one as well. So it's just got some famous people that have contributed to the art, uh, the art and olfaction, the olfaction, olfactive world, the perfumery world in some way. My favourite one on this is this Guillaume Rolland who created a olfactory alarm clock which wakes you up with scent. Yeah, I really want that. <laughs> it's an alarm clock. Goodbye shrill ringing and beeping. Hello scent of toast, coffee or even freshly cut grass. I mean, who doesn't want that alarm clock in their life? There's even a website where you can get it. This is just, yeah, there's a lot going on. So, one of my favourite features of this magazine, it was my one of my favourites in the last one, and it's here as well, it's called Odorama, and they go in depth. Uh, it's about a four-page double spread, each one talking about a different thing. They normally do a natural thing, so the last one was blackcurrant, and this one they talk about the carrot. They talk about rosy cheeks, culinary uses, perfumes that it's contained in, uh, perfumery, ge genetic makeup, all of that kind of stuff. So black currant was the last one, this one's carrot. Then they talk about a molecule. They did ISOE Super in the last one and this one's ionones. So ionones are what's responsible for things smelling kind of vi violety and sometimes iris and powdery. Again, molecular structure, perfumes that you can find it in. Um, just a whole thing about ionones. It's just so informative. I really, really love it. I just recommend it. If you're a super perfume lover like me, it's just like a, I don't know, it's just like a, a Pandora's box of stuff that just keeps coming at you. Uh, this one, this bit here was really good. It's about the sense of smell of the blind and uh, talking about the 
the fact or is it a myth that blind people have a heightened sense of smell or are more perceptible to smell so that was really interesting as well can you separate sight from smell uh, really really cool and then it's kind of like a, a fantasy bit this but not fantasy but the last one they did the scent different sense of a car and this one is all about drugs and I really liked this because it's got this party house party scene and it's got all these people taking different drugs and I was trying to go through them thinking oh what are they taking what are they doing um, and yeah so it's got the smell of lots of different drugs on the next bit cannabis cigarettes uh, cocaine poppers yeah and whether they're toxic whether they're illegal whether they are have natural elements so yeah that's I guess that's kind of controversial but it was still an interesting read so the next bit is uh, connections and this one has an open letter to a master perfumer from I guess someone that's trying to break into the industry it's quite lengthy actually and it's they're a little bit fantasy they're not I don't think they're real letters to real perfumers but in the last one Jean-Claude Eleanor wrote a let open letter to a junior perfumer which was really nice so I like that too then there's a couple of pages about a legendary actress Sarah Bernhard I always go to say Sandra Bernhard I need to stop that every time I look at this page which has been a lot of times it's it's Sarah Bernhard French actress and just about uh, her role in not perfumery because she wasn't a perfumer but they talk about, I made a note here, it's, they talk about her apartment and the way it would have smelled because she, has, she had lots of um, rugs and polar bear things and ocelots and just um, the smell of animals and flowers because she constantly had lilies and camellias all over her apartment. Uh, there's a picture of her in her apartment there as well. And she also used to douse the rugs and curtains in amber and jasmine. So they talk a little bit about that. It's a bit about her uh, career and stuff. I mean, I didn't know who she was. Maybe I'm uncultured, but you can't know everything, right? So that's really cool. The next bit talks about a painting uh, with seven, eight men in it. And it tells you about who they all are. And it says it was painted by Henry Latour. It was completed at a time when perfumers and painters were about to undergo a real artistic revolution. So, still staying with the art, guys. Still staying with the art. Then what's this one? Oh yeah, this one, they did something similar in the first issue where it was a photographer. I think that it was a perfumer and a photographer walked around the same district of Paris and it was their interpretation of what they saw and smelled and felt. This one it's in Amsterdam. There's some really lovely photography. It's a photographer, historian and perfumer. So they talk about the canal smell and the flowers. It's just visually stunning. I said that last time and I'll say it again because it's just such a tree. It's just so beautifully put together that every page has got something new that's visually stunning as well as informative. There's only a couple of adverts too. It's got the boats there. Anyway, I'll leave you to read that one if you get this magazine. Then there is an uh, interview with a guy called Olivier Rollinger, who is a spice master. Not really about perfume, but he talks about his... He gets spices from all over the world and creates these unique blends out of them. That bit was okay, but it didn't really talk about perfume that much. But that's okay. I'm not mad at Lee Magazine. This I loved. So this was about an art exhibition by a guy called Roberto Greco and it was all about decay and he worked with a perfumer to create a perfume that you would wear while you're walking around the art exhibition and it's got all these decaying flowers. The perfume had things in it like chamomile and mushroom and mould and swear and that's something that I would have loved to have gone to. It was in 2017, which maybe I could have if I had read this magazine <laughs> sooner. I can't read them quick, guys. It's, it's too much. It's too much info. So I, I really just savour them. And they're 20 euros, so they're not exactly very cheap. But I really liked that one. That was really cool. The Scent of Darkness. I can't even remember what, that, what this one was. Oh, it was about an, uh, an exhibition. A white cube punctuates the end of the... the I can't remember. 
I think it's where they put lots of people into a complete blackness and projected scent at them or something. Anyway, Oud. You have a spread all about Oud, some lovely photography again. All about the processes and consumers and the bit I found most interesting about this is how it takes Oud decades to form. I mean the resin, the tree to produce the resin once the infection happens. And naturally it's caterpillars that do it, that's why it takes so long. But now they drive nails into the tree which forces the infection to happen and then the resin to be produced which is really cool. So there's some nice examples of Oud perfumes. You know, you're not gonna get away from Oud. Then, oh, I think this is probably my favorite part of the entire magazine. It's a really fascinating and in-depth interview with Anik Manado, who's obviously a hugely famous perfumer. Just every answer that she gives to the questions, I was just, my jaw was dropping every time I read an answer. I just kept going, oh, she's amazing. She made Hypnotic Poison. She talks about industry, kind of like what they did with Francis Kirkjian, except this is a bit lengthier, this interview. Um, it's just really awesome. And then it's got examples of her perfumes she's made. She made Hypnotic Poison, she made Bois d'Argent, she made Bulgari Black, she made Lolita Lempica. And what did I make notes of here? Ah, oh, she worked on the scent of Pizbuin sun cream, which is my sun cream of choice every time I go on holiday. That is my sun cream. It is my holiday smell. I take it to every country that I visit. And I just didn't know that it was her that had a hand in making it. So when she mentioned that, I just went, oh my gosh, she made Pizbuin sun cream smell. If you haven't smelled it, you should smell it. It's really, really nice. <laughs> she also mentions about uh, Parisian taxi drivers, which I really liked as well. She said that m most Parisian taxi drivers have the yellow magic tree hanging in their car. She said, I don't know why, that's just the choice. And she said it's a simple, um, it's a simple composition of coumarin, vanilla, coconut and grapefruit. And when Amour Amour by Cacherel was released on the market, she noticed that same core accord in that perfume and she thinks that that contributes to its success because every person that gets into a taxi would be smelling this in Paris and then when Cacherel released that perfume, why wouldn't they? It reminds them of that nice smell in taxi. So I liked that, I thought that was quite funny. She didn't say it's a fact, but she thinks that's why it contributes to it. So then you have uh, their decade. They did 60s in issue three. This one they do 70s. I am wondering, they're gonna run out soon. I mean, I've got four, five more issues of this, so they can only go so far, and I'm wondering what they're going to replace it with. But yeah, 70s. Uh, it's a really cool article. It talks about the rise of green florals in the 70s, where urbanites were longing for a sense of outside of a city, you know? It was the, the rise of that. Uh, so things like Chanel Number no. 19, uh, stuff like that. But then it talks about how Orientals burst onto the scene and pretty much stomped out green florals. Orientals became just the wanton thing for people because they were so opulent and rich. Uh, she talks, it talks about a kind of battle between brands where opium was released and it just dominated the market, which of course, I mean, I was really intrigued by this bit since I'm an Oriental lover. Uh, opium dominated the market. It was a little bit, you know, mysterious because it's got a name that's associated with drugs. It looked very oriental. It was Japanese packaging. And then Estee Lauder were like, hey, that perfume is really similar to our youth Jew, which we released way before. So hold on a second. And then they retaliated and released Cinnabar. And then Lancome jumped on the bandwagon and released Magie Noir. And it was kind of like a battle of the big brands releasing their big orientals just great. I just really liked that part. So that's a really cool article about the 70s. There's a lot going on there. Really, really fun. Oh, I forgot to say, they always come with a scratch and sniff card as well. Pass it around. This one, cannabis. It still smells as well. I actually use this as a bookmark when I'm reading it. So the next part of the magazine is called The Fantasy Boutique. And they have icons, legends, famous people from that era 
and it's as if they've walked into a shop and they asked them questions and they sent them. So this one's got people like Bob Marley, the leader, I don't know who that is. Sorry, I don't know who everyone is, but I still enjoyed reading it. Uh, Muhammad Ali, Francois Truffaut. <laughs> so yeah, that's like fantasy scenting a celebrity, which is really fun. They did it in the last one too. And then you come to the main article, which is perfume and art. So this is very lengthy, obviously, it's the main article. There was a lot happening in this. The main thing is, is perfume and art. Are perfumers artists? And then it talks in depth about that. But then it got to some really cool parts uh, from people that are quite high up in the industry and it, they were giving their opinions on whether they think perfume is an art or is, is it not. Are perfumers artisans? Um, just, just a lot of interesting insight, I thought. And some of them don't think perfume is an art and they're perfumers themselves. They're like, no, it, it's not. Like it's blah 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 blah. They, there's lots of arguments going around. So do you think perfume is an art? I'll read you the statement that I agreed with most. It was the opinion of Luca Maffei, who is an independent perfumer at Atelier Fragrance Milano. It's a short one. It says, for me, all perfumers are artists, just like all musicians or all designers. It's one of their fundamental characteristics. If there is creation, there is art. The perfumer's work consists in translating an idea or vision into perfume. What does it matter whether this idea is conceived in their head or someone else's? It's the ability to realise in it it in scent that constitutes their art. But to succeed, the perfumer has to have developed the skills to balance their records. Without this, they cannot communicate with those who receive their creation. Furthermore, a perfume is not intrinsically beautiful. It either moves the person experiencing it or it doesn't. By contrast, we need to give up on this idea that an unusual perfume is necessarily artistic. This is a common conflation in niche perfumery, but it's incorrect. A perfume is artistic when it tells a story or when it triggers an emotion in those who smell it. That's the statement I agreed with the most. Francis Kirkjean puts his um, two cents worth in. Even Jean-Claude Elena is in here as well. Yeah, it's, it's really great, this one. And there was something that I wanted to mention as well, that they talk about a lawsuit that Mugler slapped on uh, Molinard in 1999 and it was all about plagiarism I guess or but the perfume version of that so they did slap a lawsuit on Molinard and it was all about Angel and Nimala this confused me a little bit because obviously Nimala came out in 19 I don't know 55 or like where does it say it's really old anyway so I was thinking, how can Mugler do that when Angel came out in 1996? Surely it would be the other way around. But then it goes on to say about, uh, it was the reformulated version of Nimala. And I don't know when that happened. So anyway, in my review of Nimala, I, I immediately picked up on the similarities between Angel and that one. I just thought that was really interesting that Mugler actually sued Molinard for Nimala. Anyway, that's that. So yeah, I anyway, mean, let's move on. So yeah, this is a really long, lengthy, yellow thing. Um, and then it got, the end bit was, I think, the best part of it. So it goes on about lots of stuff. And then it has an overview of olfactory art. This sent me into a Google frenzy and it's still going to, I need to reread this whole part because it talks about so many different art exhibitions or artists that have incorporated scent or smell or odour or aroma into their art pieces and there's so many that have intrigued me, so many that I need to look them up and so many that I wish I'd seen. There's one where a guy, I'll name a few of my favourites, there's one where a guy, it was just one room and he had the floor covered in lots and lots of talcum powder and it had a single candle burning at the end and he pumped in the smell of gas and it was meant to make you feel very uncomfortable walking on clouds but smelling gas and seeing a flame together which I think is genius. There was another guy who stuck 750,000 cigarette butts to a wall and it was like a room of cigarette butts. Um, there's one that I've actually seen which was ho horrendous, it's Damien Hurst, it was called A Thousand Years and it was basically a cow's head 
a real cow's head, people, in a perspex giant box with just thousands of flies flying around. And the smell in this art exhibition was just unreal, very uncomfortable. But so many, so many things here. There's, it mentions loads. I could just go on and on and on where I was just thinking, wow, I would love to go and see that. There was, what did I say? There's one about Seven Deadly Sins. There was an art exhibition where they tried to recreate the smell of the moon based on an astronaut's description. Um, gosh, just loads. And then it goes on to talk about Christoph Laudemiel. This is still in the same article, who actually created, I think it was an exhibition or something where he created 15 compositions based on Perfume at the Story of a Murderer, the year that the film came out. Christoph Laudemiel is the guy behind the zoo. I did a spotlight on their company recently. Uh, and it was released as a coffret, a limited edition coffret by Terry Mugler. Where do we get our hands on this, people? Does anyone know? Has anyone smelled this before? Fascinating. I need to, I need to, uh, I need to go and see that. I need to smell it, I need to see it, I need to get my nose on it. So, yeah. Just loads. One's about a woman who's made the smell of her vagina. I just, yeah. There's one where they make things out of blood from cartel murder victims. All that kind of stuff. Gory stuff that I just really like. Anyway, coming towards the end, really great article called Lifting the Lid on the Perfume Counterfeit Game. This is all about dupes and it's all about the morality of it. Is it, is it morally correct? The loopholes that companies can get through because technically perfume can't be copyrighted. Just the lies that get told, you know, just a lot of stuff. It's really, really good. It's about cost cutting, cost and value, terminology of what is actually fraud and what isn't in the perfume world. It mentions a couple of sites that have been sued before. Uh, yeah. Then at the very end, well, towards the very end, it has an article about Christopher Chung, who is the creative director of Amouage, and what he did with the company when he came to uh, take over as creative director, because he didn't fi found the company. But what he's done, it's not very long, but it's, it just talks about who he is and, and what he's done for the company, which I liked. It's a little bit of insight into Amouage, because I like them. Then, like the other issue, they had a timeline of the trends of perfumery and who wore what over time, where Fourgères crossed over, men started wearing more feminine things and stuff like that. And this one is all about floral aldehydes, starting with Chanel number no. 5. And it's like a little flow chart of perfumes where it kind of branched out into crisp floral aldehydes, um, aldehyde orientals, powdery aldehydes, just, it's just an aldehyde fest. And it's really cool. I like that too. This is so much you can just, you can just go back over, you know. Manifesto for a healthy culture of perfume criticism. This is about bloggers, reviewers, people just giving their criticisms on perfumes and how it's healthy, how it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It just shows passion and it happens in multiple other industries anyway. Uh, it's just a, it's just a natural thing. That, that was okay, I guess. Then it's got their 30 favourites that happened at the end that have been released recently. That happened at the end of the last one as well. And Louis de Bacalite is number one, which I'm really happy about. So it's got, it's kind of like mini reviews of 30 perfumes that came out recently. Concrete there. Aura by Mugler. That I actually haven't read in full, but I will. And then... Finally, it's just got exhibitions and stuff, all of which I've missed, because I read them too late. But yeah, that's a really cool thing. That, and then, it's, then it just goes on about books, different perfume books you can try out, art and flavour. Uh, what else? Hopefully I'm holding this in the right place. Ah, it's really hard to hold it up and talk to you and look at it at the same time. Designing with Smell, catalogue of remembered smells, and then where to find new magazine. You can subscribe here as well. So yeah, that is... That's basically it. That's that's the third, fourth issue of New Magazine. Grubby fingerprints. It's super fun. I'm not affiliated with them. I'm just trying to spread the love of this. If you're a perfume lover and you like to read and, you know, for this one, if you're into art as well, this is going to be 
the combination of a lifetime for you. So I'm not necessarily into art, but I, I really am into that whole bringing smell into art thing. I think that's really fascinating. So I love this. I will do issue five once I've read it. But for now, I wanted just to have a quick chit chat with you guys about this because it's it's just fun. You can really just sink your teeth into it. So Knee Magazine, I'll post a link to their website so you can have a look if you care to. Anyway, I hope you guys are staying safe and sane. I'm doing okay, I hope you are. UK just announced another kind of three week lockdown with very vague kind of rules. We're all a little bit going. But anyway, we'll get through this guys, we will. I'll speak to you guys very soon. I'm Axel Mono, trying to make the world smell better. One video at a time. Goodbye. <laughs>